Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I am your host, Tracy Stuckrath founder of Thrive Meetings and Events and this podcast, which you're listening to now. And on this show, I talk about all things food and beverage with expert in all facets of food and beverage, inclusivity and contracting and farmers and doctors and a variety of other things. I love learning and I have been learning for the last this hundred episodes or more from all these great experts. And I hope that you have too. And with my guest today, I do want to point out and something that I should be saying, should have been saying for a while, because we're all about inclusivity here, is that while StreamYard does not have closed captioning or have captioning on the platform itself as of yet, I think they are working on it. When I do upload these to YouTube after the fact, they will have the captioning at the bottom of that. So just so that everyone is aware of that, I am cognizant of it. So Let's get started with this week's episode, which my guest is a longtime friend, Joan Eisenstadt, who is a respected industry veteran who operates out of Washington, D.C., my old hometown, and she has a meetings consulting business since 1981. Um, A consultant, teacher, mentor, she's been honored by industry associations, including the 2004 induction into the Events Industry Council's Hall of Leaders. Joan believes asking better and deeper, tell me more questions, leads to better negotiations, contracts, and meeting experiences. Hello, my friend. How are you? Hi, Tracy. It's nice. This is lovely doing this. Thank you. And I'm going to also do our disclaimer that you were nice to put on on the information about this, and that is that neither of us is an attorney and that the information we're providing is professional experience and advice and that we always suggest you contact a lawyer especially when you're doing contracts and have them read over and approve what you're working on. Thank you for doing this disclaimer because yes, I am not an attorney. I am not a nutritionist or a nurse or anything like that. So definitely from personal experience and then just you and I chatting and listening to other planners around and listening to other attorneys that we know more than a dozen industry attorneys and definitely paying attention to that. So thank you so much. This, so we're talking about hotel contract, food and beverage contracting, and we're going to really focus in on hotels um, today because you've got other venues and other convention centers and things whose contracts go into a much deeper or different direction in uh, in a lot of cases as well. And even offsite catering, right? That's a whole nother type of contract as well. I want to actually start with the conversation we were having just before we came live is that there are so many things in a contract and food and beverage is quote unquote, there's always a standard clause, if you want to call it standard in hotel contracts and it gets looked over and everybody says, oh, it's going to be on the BEO, handle the BEO. But as from my experience in asking planners, the BEO is not looked at until two weeks out, three weeks out, maybe four weeks out. And we need to be planning food and beverage way in advance. So I'm going to take us back even farther than that. I'm going to suggest that when you're planning the goals and objectives for your meeting, when you're writing the RFP, that you need to think about food and beverage at that point. It's not ancillary to the meeting. Even if you think you're not going to have any food and beverage events, then what you need to do is make sure that you cover that and to say that. Because one of the things in negotiating that I think a lot of us know, but not everybody does, that when hotels are evaluating what business is going to fit well at what point, they're going to look at the whole package. And so if you have food and beverage, you need to specify in the RFP what you're doing, what your demographics are, everything that you would do with the rest of the meeting goes into the food and beverage issue so that from the RFP, 
then comes the proposal, then the negotiations, and then the contract. The thing that I think, and, and it's also, I love that we're doing this right now in December, which is to me the dreaded month for meeting planners. It's not only now year-end contracts, meaning our normal cycle. We're also dealing with still replacing meetings. We're right. dealing with the meetings that have to be moved because a lot of groups are still uncertain about the first quarter of 22 mm-hmm. um, and COVID and other issues that may impact. Uh, certainly for me, supply chain, especially when we talk about food and beverage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that I'd love, thank you for saying about the tell me more. I think, I think that what we don't do is we don't provide good information to start in the RFP. And then what we don't do is to provide better information as we negotiate And we don't keep up on the news and its impact Mm -hmm. on how everything impacts every bit of a meeting and certainly every bit of a negotiation. It's so true. And we do have to think more about it with that RFP and then even with site visits, right? Because sometimes you get that proposal back. But I was saying in another show, I think it was with Mark Cooper and Sean Anderson, that you get the proposal back and it's still cookie cutter. There's nothing out of the ordinary, even if you ask more questions in your RFP, a lot of those answers are not even being addressed. And we need to so just, just knock just them a out. Quick, a quick note on that, because I, I want to talk, we will talk specifically about the F and B portion. Right. I think that the, I think there are a lot, there are a lot more issues now. First of all, hotels are understaffed. 100%. Um, organizations yeah. are understaffed. Hotels are understaffed. To me, when an extensive RFP is provided, and I often for clients will say in the letter that goes with the RFP, that if you do not, if you do not answer all of our questions, you will not be considered as a venue for this meeting. I think that we have to get better at being specific. Without specificity, the contract can't be specific. So Yes, I get it. I understand why it would be a stock contract or a stock proposal. And I think we have to look at the issues we're dealing with now and be really explicit about what we're doing. Well, and it 100% agree. And Bonnie Sepikowski was on the show a couple of weeks ago and talking about an event she just did a couple months ago about the salesperson would not let, would not, she, Bonnie didn't want to sign it until she got more details about food and beverage. And she had to take it upon herself to pick up the phone and call the food and beverage director and the chef directly circumventing that salesperson to make sure she could get the food and beverage that she wanted and the ideas that she had. And it turned out to be a more spectacular meeting. And because she was more specific about it and wanted to talk to those experts who manage that part of it versus just signing on the dotted line and saying, hey, we're going to handle it. So that brings up a few issues. Of course, everything for me brings up 10 (laughs) other issues. So the first is that I think that one of the things that happens and has happened for years in the industry is people are rushed to sign contracts. I started by saying we're at the time of the year when year-end contracts should be signed. And of course, it usually means the second and a half week of December because people are going away for the holidays. So I think that to me, when someone says to me, when someone from the supplier side says, it's okay, you can sign this. We'll fill in the details later. That's an absolute no. Um, We don't do that because once it's signed, yes, you can renegotiate. And a lot of us have to now because circumstances have changed. The second thing is that I think, again, we're having to be more flexible because the staffing at hotels is different. We now have people who don't have the experience of those that we used to work with, and we have to find a way to deal better with that. The third thing is I have been laughed at um, frequently that my contracts are very long. And, And so the reason they're long is that every time you have a difficult experience, Every time you hear of another experience that is difficult, what you do is you go back and you read the contracts that you've signed and Mm -hmm. you think, what should I have done differently? Um, And and I use, I have a checklist that I use with clients that is, I call it my negotiation contract checklist and not everything will apply. I just helped a group um, with a, a relatively small event, meaning it was fewer than 150 people 
And they asked me to go through and look at the contract and give them feedback. Actually, it was a proposal. That's the other thing. The industry calls everything a contract. When you get something back, it's a proposal. You haven't agreed on the terms. Until you negotiate and agree and sign, it's not a contract. Okay, at least that's my understanding, and lawyers speak up if I'm <laughs> misstating that. And what I said to the person was, re-look at the checklist. Let's make sure that what we have talked about from the RFP perspective and the checklist, how many things are covered. And if they're not, we need to revisit all of those pieces. I did, This was interesting because this is one of the things, that, in addition to giving short shrift to the F and B portion, I think that most, I think most hoteliers and I think most planners don't thoroughly read the documents they're signing. I, I don't think that I know that from a lot of experience. And the importance of that is that there are, I have a colleague who calls it, I'm going to get contract pong, pong clauses, clause pong, clause pong. So that's what it is. So it's like if something, if you have something here that doesn't fit here and they should fit and they should right. complement each other, that they need to do that. So what happens is people gloss over. They know what they think should be there. Right. And they read it. So let's do on food and beverage. One of the big issues for me is that it's overall, that there isn't specificity. And mm -hmm. so let's say that you're signing a contract this year for late 22, 23, 24, 25, whatever year you might be, or six months from now, three months. And it says that food and beverage prices will not increase more than X percent. <laughs> and they, they fill in the X, let's say three or five percent over the prices on our current menus. There are a number of issues with that. First of all, I'm surprised that hotels are even willing to say any percentage increase because we don't know. The availability of food is gone. There is a shortage of cream cheese in New York. And all of us who know who can't imagine having a bagel without a schmear, meaning of cream cheese, can't imagine. So there is a shortage of cream cheese. You cannot get it at delis in New York. Wow. We no, we do not know what's available and what will be and what the prices will be. So the second part of that is that menus are now digital. It used to be when we got our proposal, we got this paper proposal with a huge stack of menus, printed menus. We don't have that anymore. Everything is digital. And I will now state my, yes, I am sustainable comment as I say this. I use tree-free paper, um, <laughs> and I'm very careful about how I use it. And I print out for contracts the current menus at the time we're negotiating and signing the contract. Without those, there's no reference point. If they That's say no more than X percent over the prices in our menus, how do you know what those prices were if you're looking at the contract three months, six months, a year, two years, five, mm -hmm. 10 years from now. And we all have to think about, I love words and I love the use of words. We have to think about what does that mean? And that's the tell me more. So right. when somebody says they won't increase this and you can ask the question, how do I manage what the prices are now? What do I need to know? What the On this contract I reviewed, and I really think the person didn't notice it, it had the food and beverage prices. It had the conditions about what could be brought in, what couldn't, and so on. It then said there would be a 25% administrative fee that was taxed. So you'd have the price of the meal or whatever. Give me a second. The price of the, the meal or whatever it would right. be. Then you'd have a tax on that. You'd probably have a, a service charge on top of the food and beverage. That would also be taxed. And they've tacked on a 25% admin fee. I had been seeing before COVID like 8% admin fees. Uh huh. And, the, and that states specifically, they do not go to the servers. This is not a banquet. Wow. 25% tax. And I think the tax is over 9%. So let's say you've even got, I can't do math that fast. So let's say you've got a $35 breakfast. Okay times i think the gratuity was 18 percent. okay okay then total is then taxed at nine i think let's use 9.5 percent 
Okay. Plus 9.5%. Uh -huh. Right. And then you've got a 25% of a 25% of that taxed at 9.25% on top of it. Okay. I didn't do that part, but that $35 meal probably just went up to $56 and probably, probably not the right number, but higher than that. The problem is people are not they're not looking closely. They're not right. understanding. They're not looking at what taxes are going up to. They're not asking when tax information will be updated. Right. When are the union, if there are unions or not even unions, labor contracts, right. when are those yep. contracts up and what's expected? We, If we're following the news, we know that workers are being paid more first to retain the ones that came back. Right. Second of all, it's attracting new workers. Right. So what we need to do is ensure that we have that we have that flexibility and we understand what it may mean in order to have in order to have a contract that gives us the guidelines that we know that we'll have to budget. And that's the thing. And Heather just put in here, Heather Reed just said common uh -huh. practice, the dollar becomes a dollar forty two. Amen, Heather. That is so yeah. true. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Um, and then I want to go back to something that Chef Francois in South Africa said is that too often food and beverage operators are not involved enough or at all during the planning phases of the business events. And I would even say the contracting part of that too. And, and that's a big, huge part of that. And I, one thing that I said to you the other day when we were getting ready for this is that there was a clause that I saw recently and, and I've seen it forever is that you're getting a ten, quote unquote 10% discount on food and beverage prices, depending on whatever they are on whatever price year that you're doing this, but not if they're custom menus. And right. so my thought process in here is like majority in having talking to caterers at hotels is that 80% of their menus are custom. They're not off that digital menu that's online right. And now with me and others, quote unquote, pushing for meeting the needs of dietary, yeah. vegans, vegetarians, if you're, if the hotel menus are not labeled for that, then the hotel is already cutting your 10% discount out. It, the answer is it, it is all part of it. And it's part of yeah. the negotiation. And yep. what's, and, and I also need to do my other disclaimer is that because I am a non-commissionable third party, it, it needs to be stated because there are some third parties who also get commission on food and beverage. Food and beverage has a very low profit margin and lower now, I think. I haven't seen new figures and I don't know that anybody is, is certain yet of what they'll be. So based higher hourly wages based mm -hmm. on certainly higher food and beverage prices, based on the in unavailability of linens and, and other equipment. Mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're going to see, I think, is that we as planners need to partner as much with hotels and not demand we get X percent yeah. discount. It doesn't mean I will not try my darndest to get all I can for clients. It does mean that I have to look at what is reasonable. Yeah. And, and, and that I want to negotiate. And, and for me on contracts, I think that provisions, clauses are, I, and I work with nonprofits. And so their budgets are not easy to work with. I think that the clauses and the language are even far more important than any discounts you get, certainly more than the concessions. Because if the language, for instance, was we talked about 10% off what, or to X percent increase over what, if we don't specify that, if we don't talk about staffing issues, if we don't talk about safety yeah. on alcohol service, if we don't talk about attrition on food and beverage, which of course there's going to be, if we don't think about all of the issues that we need to cover in a contract, then we're not doing our jobs. We're simply, we're allowing a document to go through that will not guide either us, if we're still working in, the, in that job or whatever parties are working on this meeting. Or And I so agree with that because it's, it is that beginning. And I've worked with you in my, in the 
contracts are very thorough and a lot more detailed. And it opens up my eyes too, because thinking about it, if it's, and you said this to me before, is if it's not in there, then how do we know? And that's like how you print the menus. And that's a good basis to do to describe that on. And some other things that I've pointed out when we're talking about dietary restrictions and things like that is like your health inspection score. And so when COVID hit last year and I was doing a ton of webinars on food safety and what does that mean? Nobody, and and I asked this question, I'm like 70% of planners had never asked about the health inspection score of the property. I know. And, and so that, that's mind blowing. That goes back to the RFP. This right. is all... This all should be in the RFP. Yes. RFPs, it's one of my arguments against some of the electronic RFPs. They don't go into enough detail. So then the planners, if the planner uses an electronic RFP and the information isn't there, then what you do is when you get the proposal back, you read it carefully and you ask a lot of questions and you put it and you, and it's again, tell me more. People right. tend to say, if let's say on that administrative fee that I saw in, in this mm-hmm. proposal, let's say that the asked the hotel what that meant. And they said, this is to help cover our losses. I don't know what the answer had been, but my guess is that it, I don't know what else right. it would have been or to cover our increased labor costs. And that is legitimate from their side. So then I think what we have to do is is take that further. So what we say then is, tell me more about your staffing. Tell me how Mm -hmm. many people were let go at the start of COVID, how many experienced people you have brought back, how, what is your staffing ratio? Is it one for a banquet? Is it one for every 25? Is it now one for every 50 because you don't have enough staff? Are they your staff? Or are you bringing in part-time people, occasional staff? And so there's, there's so many issues just on food and beverage on if you just take a banquet. Right. Um, and we haven't even begun to talk about bar service and alcohol service and all of the pieces that our danger or any of the inclusion issues, heights of buffets and how right. we help people navigate. Well, and the, um, looking at just looking at when we're negotiating our contracts too, and we're still considering the space, space opportunities or challenges, however you want to look at it. And the staffing of that too is like, what kind of space do you have? And does my food and beverage minimum have to meet a different threshold because of that, but also because of the staffing is does your type of service, you may have to change the type of service you have based on their levels of service. So if you typically have a seated and served dinner awards banquet, you might not be able to do that because there's not enough staff to be able to handle that. that That's interesting. So on the staff, the, the space issue, having just list, having just, because I'm dealing with it, the Mayor de Blasio um, of New York has now instituted um, a mandate for vaccines for private sector employees. Yep. If we move into right now, the the rate of COVID in a number of states is rising. We still have Christmas and New Year's to get through, and we don't know what it will be. It's usually seven to fourteen days post travel, then we see a spike. What we don't know is if we're going to go back to, in some places, the necessity of space, of greater amount of space around people. So if we don't have that space, how does that impact our food and beverage? How does that impact, again, as you said, the service? What does that do to pricing? What? How do we cover all this? And we, none of us will ever get a contract that covers everything. It's impossible. Yeah, it it's is. impossible to anticipate. What you can do, though, is is begin to put in some deadlines. At this, if not specific, but for instance, to say if there are these changes, here's when the hotel will notify you. And at that point, how, what you'll discuss, and you will then do what you need right. to do to amend the contract. It, it's what I said earlier about flexibility. We are not. We never were in a position to be absolute about anything. I love when planners say that should be in the contract. That should be, you should absolutely get that, right? No, you absolutely shouldn't get that. You should negotiate 
and determine right. what works for the parties. I, I, when I, we were talking earlier, and I told you I was on a call with with some suppliers about a, an event that was happening that night. The menus had been decided. The chef that day wanted fresh produce, could not get the green beans that were to be on the plate, and had to call the client and say, "This is what I can get." Are you okay with that? At that point, what is the the group could say, no, that's not. Right, go exactly. Find, go find green beans. Go produce them. Um, go get a <laughs> 3D printer and give me some green beans. And so I think that we, this is where planners, when people tell me, no, they don't read the news. No, they're not following what's going on. Shame on them. Because unless you understand what the supply chain issues are, unless you understand that hotels are going through the same things we are at home in trying to get what we need. Chicken wings are, I, I don't know, what, I, this is awful. I don't know if the rest of the chicken parts are available where the wings are going anyway, but, <laughs> um, but clearly we need more wings than right. okay. other parts, right? Because of when you serve wings. Hey, Jim Spillows posted a question in here. Okay. Um, it said, Considering this conversation, should hotels in the future consider food and beverage as a loss leader just to fill heads and beds? Oh, I, Jim, I can't answer that. That's that really is a that's a tough question. It's a good question, and I think that it would be impossible. I think to do that from a financial point of view and an operational point of view, could it be done? Would they consider it? I think that. It, it will, of course, like everything else, and quoting my dear friend, Barbara Dunn, who is an attorney, it depends, <laughs> and everything depends. Um, I think that the cost of food and beverage, the cost of service, the labor for preparation, the labor for cleanup, everything is so expensive that I would find it, I think, irresponsible to owners and to the general state of the industry to make it a loss leader. There could be opportunities for someone to negotiate differently. I try to be fair and thorough. And so I think it is a question that I will ask of someone I know. I'll get back to you because I, I am curious. One of the resources I've had since early COVID that has been really outstanding is Cornell University has what they call keynotes. So it's e hyphen Cornell and they're keynote, called keynotes. And so many of them have been on F and B on hotel operations and all of that. So I'll ask some of the people that I've met through there, what they think, Tracy, you can get that information somewhere if they think it's doable. I, I think, you know, you know, I, again, I go back to looking at my contract checklist and I look at even just under F and B, all of the issues, and it has to do with when guarantees are due, Mm -hmm. um, how far out, what the overset is, if there is one. And that's going to be an interesting question because a lot of people think there should be overset of 10%. So if I guarantee 100 people, they will set for 110. But the question they set for and be able to serve the same meal to 110 mm -hmm. or just set the space for. And with the shortage of so many food items, we don't know what it's going to be. Or it could be 5% or 2%. Or there may be no overset. And right. so we have to look at all of the pieces that go in. The same way we look at when we're looking at guest room types, not only the nights and, right. and so on, but you want to look at the, the bed types. You're going to look at all of the same kinds of pieces with food and beverage. And it's also knowing your history. And I know COVID's going to throw a wrench into that as well. But how many people do you actually track, say that you've got 2,000 people that are registered for your event? Are you actually tracking outside of your guarantees on your banquet event orders, how many people are actually showing up? Because you may guarantee 500 or 1,000, but only 500 people show up. And one of my clients realized that when we went through that process of what was the service and definitely be asking how many plates get picked up. And granted, Joan, you may or Jim might go through the buffet twice and take two different <laughs> plates. Oh, but, Jim is only going to barely touch it because he's doing healthy eating, whereas yes, he all eat this other portion. <laughs> well, and, and it's just, it's figuring that out, but it's knowing your history and putting that into the RFP. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And so let me mm -hmm. add to that. The other thing, and this isn't a contractual issue. It is an operational issue. It is watch what goes back. In other words, if you do a plated meal, 
watch what's on the plates as they go back to the kitchen. Yes. So that you have an idea of, of what people did not want to eat. Yep. Um, and I think that we're, we're all looking at how to be healthy and sustainable and appropriate for the mm-hmm. events that we're serving. Early in COVID, and I don't, and again, I'm still in the early stages of menus with some 2022 meetings. When I got the, the menus for a client and they were, because of safety at that point, they were, if you wanted more water in your water glass, they were giving you a whole new glass. So they weren't leaving pictures on the table. They weren't right. refilling the glass on the table and they were charging for that additional glass of water. So what we, again, if you think about it, so mm-hmm. it's having enough glasses, it's having enough servers to put the glass out. It's then the dishwashers and the power and the water, yep. and there's a water shortage. And right. so this is, again, my, this is how my brain works. This is, we were talking about the article about how brains work and communication of the brain. I connect all of those dots. My friend Diane calls it, oh, look, a chicken. And so it's looking at if this is, then what does that connect to? What does that mean for my food and beverage events? What does that mean that I need to, if I don't, even if I don't contract it, what do I need to keep in my notes that I'll be aware of so that as we get closer, if we're not planning our menus until closer. And in some cases we can't. Our clients who book 10 years out so if 10 years out, we're not going to plan menus. We have no idea what we would even begin to think about for those menus. We know, we think we know, we think we know right. that there may be X number of food and beverage events, but we're not sure. That all, yeah. I have one client that has now, because of safety, because of money, um, has eliminated all food and beverage, including even food and beverage for their staff room. Because now, so my question on that, is there appropriate outlets, depending on the size of the group, inside the property as well as outside the property for that, that entire group to go what to? what we're now dealing with because things I can't say that will be too specific, enough specific to identify stuff. <laughs> How's that? We can't get solid answers. And so... It is a it's a catch it is a catch twenty two. Yeah. It's how do you plan around that? I look, I live in downtown DC, literally in DC. People think, oh, DC, she must be in Maryland or Virginia. I'm across from the FBI. In our neighborhood, the number of restaurant closures is immense. We're grateful to Jose Andres, not only for the good work he does, but for keeping his restaurants open. They're some of the few in our neighborhood that stayed open through the pandemic, even some clearly just for carry out. So I think that what we have to do is look at what does it mean? And then that, of course, goes back to the whole scheduling of the program. Are we allowing enough time for people? And I'm hearing from people who are attending meetings that the lines at the, the coffee outlets and hotels is absolutely too long and, and people don't wait. But if you give, that's scheduling too, right? So if you give people a 15 minute break, it's not enough time to right. use the facilities, stand up, talk to people, get on, for me, get on my scooter and scoot out and get where I need to go, go get something to drink if we're not serving it. And, and I said to you early, I, I've done this work for 50 years and I don't think there's been a year that's gone by where I haven't heard why is coffee so expensive. Um, <laughs> I think if people pay attention to to coffee growing, to the climate, to, again, labor, to all of the things, to water and the availability of it. I think that we have to, we have to ask those questions. We have to say to a hotel and hotels have to be able to respond. How are these issues impacting your pricing? How are they impacting availability? And then we decide what we want to put in a contract and we negotiate that as partners, and we get it in writing. Anything that is just understood between parties and isn't documented is not going to work very well when there's a dispute. A hundred percent agree. And we have to, something you said just triggered something which went right out of my brain as well. But it, and because it reminded me of like, Chef Francois, I'm getting him involved into this conversation up front when we're looking at things and how we're doing it. And figuring out what his capabilities are in general and that property's capabilities, but his staff's capabilities and and putting it out there. And again, whether it goes into the contract or not, 
but it's also predetermined that or pre understood how this is going to work. So it's, but it's in talking to the planners when I'm teaching at IMAX or wherever, it's really, we don't spend enough time on this aspect of our contracts and what's going into it. And with it being our number one expenditure and our industry's number one expenditure, you would think that we would have a better kind of grasp on food and beverage, but we don't because there are so many other facets that play into it. We don't. That it makes it really hard. We don't spend enough time on contracts, period. True. We gloss over them and we read them. People read them for the old rate states and space. And right. they don't look at the nuances of what is what it is and is not said. We don't look for error. And let's say that it's, it, it writes out 30%, but in parentheses, it says 40%. Which is it? And so we don't pay attention to all of it. And Attorneys say, industry attorneys, and I strongly agree, you read everything out loud and you do it again and again and you ask questions. And one of the things I think planners, food and beverages, uh, on the list of things I hate doing, it's planning other people's meals. I haven't, we have enough trouble at home deciding what to have for dinner. So, Likewise. Um, so, <laughs> so for me, it's very difficult. To, to work on food and beverage, but on con- contractual issues, I can think about what are the things that impact the outcome? What are the things that impact a client's budget? What impacts the hotel's income um, so that they can operate and get enough people to be servers? What impacts the servers? What's going to happen in New York City or anywhere else if, in fact, there will be a mandate? for vaccination or for boosters. The latest thing um, that we're all talking about is when will we start having, in addition to saying, have you been vaccinated or tested? When was your booster? Because the efficacy of the original vaccines is waning. So what are we looking at Mm -hmm. in terms of the service people? And what makes me, this is a, a side note to food and beverage. I've been frustrated that in all the conversations that have been had in this industry about safety and about who should be masked and who shouldn't, the thing that is not discussed is not only are we protecting ourselves with other participants, what about the staff of the facility in which we are holding a meeting and their safety? If they're sick and they can't come to work, then we have no service and we risk the, their lives and the lives of others. So right. I think it's a holistic way of looking at Agreed. contracts, food and beverage, con- food and beverage portions of contracts for at the BEOs, at all of the pieces that make up that. And what we didn't touch, and I'll do it quickly, is one of the things that that is often mentioned in, in hotel proposals is you'll abide by our policies, and yet right. the policies are not attached. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you don't know what those policies are, then you don't know what you're agreeing to abide by. And when you say, I thought we would have X and you don't, you agreed to it. So this is back to the specificity of understanding and looking and and asking deeper questions. And so true, because just saying that reminds me of a 38 page document that was attached meeting planner guide to one hotel. And there was one line, one bullet on, and this has to do with AV, one bullet and 38 pages that says that you're not allowed to have any outside audiovisual except for one in your 25 room meeting. You're only allowed to have an outside AV company to manage one room. Correct. And it's just, so the same thing about food and beverage. And let's see what Chef Francois just put up here. It says it's difficult for most planners to focus on F and B because it's not their field of expertise. I'm absolutely loving this engagement with Joan. You're welcome, Francois. <laughs> um, and I, hey, I need to set up a call with you, anyways. So thank you for the reminder. Thank you for being here. But um, it it is oh now that thought went away from me again that I because it came back, but it's. It, it just goes back to asking a lot of questions up front. And it's like, why? It, and why? It's, 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 provide, it's providing, inf- it's first providing the information. It's providing your goals and objectives, including your goals and objectives for any 
um, F and B event? Are you having a speaker? Are you not having a speaker? Right. Is it for people to network? Do you have a time frame? What about? And I don't know that we're going to be doing much preset anymore. I've never liked preset. I just keep thinking of all the dust that's flying around as people come into a room and landing on my salad. What are we going, how are we going to operate? And I think that we have to be very specific in the RFPs. We do have to talk with more than the salesperson at the hotel. Mm -hmm. We need to talk with the chef. We need to talk with the food and beverage director or whomever is in charge of that. And that's all changing too, because hotels are operating very differently than they were um, before we went into a pandemic. And we are not post-pandemic. We don't know when we're going to be even um, at at a place where we can operate in some fashion that we're not even talking about COVID. We're not Mm -hmm. there. WHO was very clear on that in in the briefing today. One of the things I learned, Tracy, early on in what I call the professional part of my career, as opposed to what I was doing before I became a professional. And I remember the first hotel I worked with when I moved to D.C., 43 years ago. And I went in and I met with the director of sales and the CSM assigned the convention services person assigned to the group. And I said, look, I've been doing this for a long time, but not in a way that I've had my questions answered. And they said, ask us everything. Tell us what you want to know. We will show you and teach you how to work better with us. And planners have to get off They're high horses, regardless of how many years of experience, because nothing is the same as it was, nor will it ever be the same. We everything changes. It was different from yesterday to today. Exactly. And so we have to say, tell me how you operate. Talk to me. My best relationships with suppliers are those who are willing to talk and to be open and to be Mm -hmm. honest and to say, you're right. I don't know what that clause in our contract means. We were told to put it there. They Mm -hmm. literally said that. And then they said, we're going to go find out. And then we're going to talk more with you and we'll figure out a solution. And so we all are, everybody is understaffed. Everybody is overwhelmed. It's holidays for a lot of people. There, there is so much going on in everybody's lives. I think that we have to be understanding. And while we're being understanding, we have to still be incredibly thorough and what is signed, especially year-end contracts that get shoved through without the appropriate language. Completely agree. And somebody just posted on here, such a logical approach. And I don't know who you are because of string Thank yard. You. I, I try to be logical. Yes. Well, and it, it, and it, well, and I just remember my thing again for the third time is like salespeople need to become friends with and, and not necessarily become friends with chefs, but understand more so because when they understand what Francois is doing, they can sell that better. And even see us becoming that partner because Debbie Bruce, thank you very much for identifying yourself. It, it because it, you can sell your property better. You can sell. You can do, uh, you can do everything better yes. when you know who you're working with when you know what they need to do, what Mm -hmm. their needs are, and we express what our needs are. I don't like hiding things. I don't like planners who say, we're going to tell them later because we don't want them to know this is how we're doing things. That's not appropriate. No. Uh, There are ethical policies in the industry, whether you are a member of something or not. And I think that to me, ethically negotiating is a smart way to go. Um, Being honest, know your partner's, know their needs, and understand what happens. Michael Dominguez, and I don't know that he's updated, I I don't know that he could update it, was doing a lot of sessions on how hotels made money um, and how they spent money. And having learned for me, having learned that years ago from these wonderful partners that I worked with so long ago, and still asking those questions and attending the eCornell programs and being in touch and reading the various publications from the hotel world so that I know what's going on. And, right. and I don't have to be best friends with anybody. I just yeah. want information. Yeah. Um, so we have to ask each other better questions. And then we have to confirm what we've agreed to in writing so that there are not a lot of questions later and that we don't get surprise bills. Oh, that we, we just need to end on that because it's just, that's what it is. It's making sure that there's no surprises. And granted, something's going to show up. Like I threw a party for Super Bowl party. I'm like three o'clock in the afternoon for six o'clock. I'm like, I need this party. So that kind of stuff is going to happen. But the more up front, the better off we are in 
in making sure everything that we know about gets executed. And, and I will make a, an offer that I'll probably, I don't want to say I'll regret it, but I am more than glad to send my checklist to anybody who wants oh, it. Um, somebody did ask for the checklist. And so just email me at joanleisenstadt at gmail.com. So it's all one word, like journal, J-O-A-N, letter L, Eisenstadt at gmail.com or ping me on Facebook or LinkedIn and I'll send it to you. Okay, I'm going to send you. I want that checklist too, as well. Thank you, and may and maybe we can combine them and add some things in there, because and and Debbie is actually with the Canadian Anaphylactic Initiative, and so she and I are going to do some other conversations as well, because of the checklists that you know that I do around food safety and food right. allergies and things like that. It's a whole other thing. So and, and that Samantha Evans does when it comes to other issues of inclusion, exactly on, on, um, yeah. ability, and I do use. I, I do talk about you in the majority of my sessions at a convention that we attended and they wouldn't allow you in early to find your seat on your scooter and then 4,000 meeting planners behind you. And, you know, I mean, how you can't maneuver your scooter through there. So that's a whole nother conversation that we can, you know, go through <laughs> around food and beverage and height and all of that stuff. And, and thank you for all the education you do. Now, before we leave, I do always ask the questions and because we're favorite food and beverage, but I want to tie it in because Hanukkah just ended, but Christmas is coming. So instead of just telling me what your favorite food is in general, what's your favorite food this time of year? Oh, latkes. Latke, and, okay. And great sour cream applesauce debate. I really prefer sour cream and then we make a wonderful fresh cranberry apple pear sauce that we <gasps> put on them. Oh yeah, it's wow. great. Um, and yeah, that's my, so latkes, latkes for all year, but especially okay. for the year. Fried food, Hanukkah is that kind of a gift. I'm going to go try that myself. So thank you. I'll Maybe I'll actually reach out to you and get that recipe for that. Sylvia, thank you so much. I agree. Great content. Thank you all for listening. This is the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Starkraft, and my guest today was Joan Eisenstein. And we love talking about food and beverage, et cetera, in general, but that's what we talk about on this show. And if you're not a member yet, join the Eating at a Meeting Facebook group. It's free to join, and we just talk about all this stuff all the time. So thanks, everybody. Stay safe and eat well. And Joan, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me, and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.